All right. So now you know how to work with PFD documents and Word documents, um, and you've you've basically enjoyed a whole bunch of rel relatively simple tasks you can do, like changing fonts and highlighting areas and messing around with you know styles and scraping them for text. We're going to cover uh, the gamut of relatively old data input files with CSV and JSON. And while JSON is currently used and is currently the rage in REST APIs, you'll notice that um, basically CSV has fallen heavily out of favor over time. It's still used as a data storage format when you don't necessarily want to have a database around, but there are issues with it primarily that you cannot take um, and perform any kind of integrity on a CSV file. So, CSV and JSON files are plain text files, and we had a really interesting question that came up in this group a while back, which is, what's a binary file and what's a text file? And the answer to this question is a little bit more subtle than one might think, because all text files are binary files but not all binary files are text files. And usually you would think of it the other way around. Binary files just contain bytes, and text is composed of bytes. One of the differentiators between a text file and a binary file is, is if you were to echo the contents of the file onto screen, you could reasonably read a text file, whereas a binary file, you would probably have some bits of information in there that might not be easily readable. So this way I want you to think of text files as a subset of binary files. They're the subset of binary files that only contain text. Okay? Who got confused on that description? I see no hand, so we'll move forward. So you can use a text editor in order to update a text file, but if you have a binary file, then generally you have to use an editor that is compatible to that binary file to update it. CSV and JSON files have something that greatly aids in their processing by multiple inputs, and that is that they are text files. So if you need to make a CSV file, you can just open up a text editor. This could be Notepad on Windows, this could be VI on uh, Linux or Unix. Um, you know, this could be any kind of editor that normally supports you typing in text. Likewise with JSON files. Okay, now, even though they are text files, they are structured text files, which means that throwing text in them anywhere you want doesn't necessarily return back the information that you need or doesn't express the information that you want to express. CSV files is a special kind of text file where the values in the file are separated by commas, hence the comma separated value, okay? Whereas JSON, and there's some opinions on how to pronounce it, uh, is a format that JavaScript uses, or at least primarily used, to do structured tree-like information inside a text file. It doesn't mean you have to store a tree in there, but you can basically take a JavaScript object and there is a corresponding JSON structure, and you can change between this JavaScript object and back, and that object might include other objects. And examples of JavaScript objects are arrays and, and uh, dictionaries or maps, depending upon which uh, naming convention you decide to use. But the point is, is that both of these are represented only using text. And so you can create your own JavaScript object by simply opening up Notepad, VI, something, typing in text, as long as you get all the curly braces and commas and colons and other items in the right place, you'll have a valid uh, JSON object. So moving right along, let's take a look at a common CSV file. All right. 
This block right here represents a CSV file with seven lines in it. Okay, each line is a line of text terminated by a new line. Likewise, each line has three fields in it. The commas separate the fields. So this first item here is some text, then there's a comma, and then you have the text of the second field, and there is a comma, and then you have the text of the third field. Now, I was very careful to say that this is text, all right? That means that when you read in this information from a CSV file, you might be inclined to think of this as the number 73. It will generally be the character 7 and the character 3. A lot of times you'll have to do the conversions. When we looked at the Excel module, the Excel module had a lot of extra information in there that would talk about the type of that field. CSV files, this is all you get. Since there's no extra information, you may have to infer what type it is based off of its position. Or you could do things like experimentally attempt to translate it to a number, maybe capturing exceptions and falling back if it doesn't translate appropriately. So this CSV file from the formatting that we can see because we are human beings and we add information that looks very similar to stuff that we're used to, is a file that contains a date and time, okay, a fruit of some sort, and then a number. All right? But when we're actually using it, these types don't exist. So we've already covered a little bit. There's no types of, of the details that comprise CSV files. They don't have types. Everything's a string. Uh, likewise, they have no annotations on them in order to say this is bold or this is a red, you know, colored string of text. Um, there's no such thing as worksheets in CSV files. Every file is considered to be the equivalent of one Excel worksheet. There's no such thing as widths and heights, because all you have is separation of data values. You can't indicate that a cell is supposed to span more than one area, because there is no place to store extra information. There's only place to store the data. So you can't say that this first cell should have a span of two, because there's no place to put that cell, uh, that span information. And of course, you can't have a standard way of embedding other items in there. So if you wanted to do, say, like a graph like we did at the end of the Excel module, there's no way to say this cell starts a graph. You can put text in there and have a program read that text out and perhaps understand that that text should somehow be translated to a graph. But this is not inherently built into CSV files. So why would we use CSV files at all? Well, because they're dirt simple. I mean, they are so simple that basically you know you're just getting a bunch of data. There's no need to have any kind of sophisticated editors or so on and so forth. Um, since they're so simple, tons and tons of programs use them. Now, most of these programs have a way of using something that's slightly more sophisticated. All right, But a lot of programs still maintain importing information from CSV files and exporting information to CSV files simply because of the history of how a lot of data was stored. A lot of data in the old days was stored in text files. And these text files represented batches of records. Every record was effectively one line in the file, and every field in the record was separated by some delimiter. Commas were very popular. If you take a look at the etc password file in Linux, colons are used there. And you'll see little leftovers of this sort of batch record processing uh, in various little places. And this means that if you're dealing with one of these older systems that use one of these delimited formats, CSV is very similar to it. Now, that said, you might want to just take a CSV file, open it up, 
read it in his raw text, call split on the commas, and start processing the fields. If you do this, your program will work for a while. Okay, and the reason it will only work for a while is because there are actual standards on how to properly embed a comma within a field as part of the value. And whatever program you write that splits on commas, it will not check the delimiters around it to see whether or not this is a separating comma or whether this is a comma that is part of the text in a field. Okay, it has to do with quotes. You put quotes around your values, then the commas within it are no longer delimiting values. Of course, that means that if you say, oh, well, I'll just grab all things with quotes around it, then that'll also start to fail because you might want to put a quote inside the value, and so the quotes themselves are also escaped. So for this reason alone, and the odds that you will probably not write a proper parser for pulling the values out between the delimit, uh, delimiters of commas, it's generally a better idea to use a CSV library that's already been validated that's doing the proper parsing of escape sequences and returning back the correct values in between. That said, if you really enjoy doing parsing yourself, there is no reason to stop you from learning this format and writing the parser yourself, but I would highly recommend, since this is sort of a book about pragmatic, using Python in order to solve quick problems, that you don't solve your quick problem by starting to write a CSV parser. Okay, so split doesn't handle the escaping, and now we'll move on. CSV is actually built into the Python language, so you don't have to do any kind of special module installation to import CSV. That said, their CSV that's built in follows a couple of patterns that are a little bit older. We'll cover that, and we'll just gloss over the, the, the parts that, um, that basically everybody would expect. Import CSV pulls in the CSV module into your namespace. And then you see that we just use the Python open on example CSV. Now, this is not the CSV open. This is the standard Python file open operation. And it's going to return back a file handle, which will be stored in example file. OK? So this is very similar to all of the other text reading that we have done so far. That said, we will use the CSV reader to read from this file object into an example reader. And now this example reader will be a CSV object, or CSV reader object, actually. And what it will do is it will provide certain facilities that make text reading even easier for CSV files. For example, it works with the list operator in order to construct a list. Okay, now that list will come back as a Python array object, and each row inside of it will already be a Python array object of the values that were in the CSV file. Okay, as you'll see later on in this class, there are also ways to do things like check what line number you're on if you're processing the file line by line and to walk over the actual lines. So here, we decided to take the reader, construct a list off of it, and then, because this is a REPL, in order to print it, we just simply type the name of the variable, and it dumps it out. So just before class, just to show you that this is not just reading a book. OK, well, here, let me do this real quick. Ah, not quit, quite. <laughs> I did it twice. OK. So this is ed.csv, a typical text file that I just created that contains the words 1 through 5, the numbers 1 through 5, and then the Roman numerals 1 through 5. It's a three-line CSV file, and we would expect to see five columns of data in it. Okay, 
So this is the import CSV that we've seen before. Here, we just opened the file, storing that object into ed file. Now, remember, there was a question before about how would you find the file. In this case, everything's in the same directory. But if you wanted to load this file from a known location, you can use both relative and absolute paths. Just make sure, yeah, it is reader. OK, now we have created a CSV reader item here. If we wanted to see what it looked like real quick, we can see that it is a CSV reader object. All right, let's make a list off of it. All right, and if we wanted to take a look at the data, you can see that we have constructed from this list three entries, one for each line, and each entry has five fields. Okay, and so this is just a quick way of representing this array of uh, this information. And the reason why this is so useful is because you can then do things like uh, if you wanted to um, print the data, you can simply say, oh, I want, now remember that this is an array, so we're doing indexed-based arguments and not natural counting. So the index of one is not this first line, but the second uh, array. And then the index of the third item is not the th number three, but actually the number four, since indexes start at zero for simplification of um, processing. Yes? Is it, is it all trivial that when Mr. Python goes to work to parse, he knew what to do with the different sorts of comments? That is, that, that, that's, just, that's their problem, not ours, and is it simple? That is, that is totally the problem of the CSV reader module, because what it will do is it will read all the characters, and it will follow the rules for these fields, and it will basically do the cutting of these fields out and packing them into arrays and other items according to the spec for CSV files. So if we wanted to again take a look at say the first row and the, uh, the fifth item in there, then we would of course just change the indexing. And so we've got a very fast way of reading CSV files into multidimensional arrays, yes? So um, generally speaking, the stuff between the commas is uh, still text. Right. And so I would expect it, so. I would expect it to, um, to retain that text, but let's find out. Because the best way to answer some of these questions <laughs> is a test. Oh, I forgot to open the ed file. Sorry. And so, as I understood it, it did work out the way that I believed, and it retained the text. Because CSV is very dumb format. It's just text. I mean, apart from the rules on how to embed commas in as text values and quotes, there's not a lot of extra to it. Okay. So, here we say that the easy way to is to just use it as a list, uh, construct a list off of the reader, and then doing that, you can use the array indexing, for example, they're using example data, row and column. 
whereas you know I use the little ed whatever the the data thing and so here they're printing out their first cell and then their second cell and their third cell and it doesn't take a lot of imagination to say write a loop that would process every row or write a loop that would process every value for a column yes So my last character doesn't have a comma either, all right? What you're running into is um, a new line argument that was created many years ago. You need to use either DOS to Unix or Unix to DOS to convert your new lines to match your platform if you're downloading the CSV file from their sources. Uh, because what will happen is uh, Windows has a carriage return new line pattern that it uses and that carriage return a lot of times there's not a good agreement on how to represent it in some processing systems. So some processing systems will uh, take the carriage return and also present it as an additional new line um, whereas other ones will perhaps just print out a hex code or print out something that looks like gobbledygook. No problem. And that has nothing to do with CSV files, but it has a lot to do with text files between multiple platforms. Uh, Linux and Unix typically uses only a new line character. Um, and, uh, you know, for one reason or another, that was not de deemed appropriate when someone stood up Microsoft Windows. Okay, so reading data from objects in a for loop. Well, you know, sometimes it's useful to not read the entire file into an array at once and then start processing it. Okay, who can think of a reason why it might not be a good idea to read an entire file into an array at once and then start processing it? Size. Thank you. We live in the era of big data, okay? Big data sometimes still comes in CSV files simply because of the portability of the format. And even if it's not all that big, if you're, say, running through a file in order to find the maximum value of a column, Generally speaking, it's inter terribly wasteful to hold every value in RAM at the same time. And so what you can do is you can take this reader that we constructed here and simply pull out the rows in it. Okay, and so this is our for variable in provider format. So for row and example reader. Example reader will basically cough up one new value for row every time in this loop and because it ends at the colon and it has this indented block here that row will be defined every time this sub block gets printed out and so what you'll notice that the row contains the array that generally was packed into the array of all results but it only contains one array at a time and we can still use the example reader and access other attributes on it that change over time, like line number. And so here we read out a line number from the reader and the row that we're processing. This means that we can print that row 1 is this array, whereas row 2 is this array. And this has the advantage of basically not maintaining all of the other rows in memory as we're processing one row. And so this way we can keep the RAM pressure on our Python scripts down. Uh, it does mean that you'll be doing a lot more interrupts in the reading process, but that is usually not very uh, problematic. And for large data, sometimes processing it in a safer way instead of processing it in the fastest possible way actually turns out to be faster because if you start RAM thrashing really bad and cache missing on your CPUs, they will not be able to 
optimize accordingly in order to do the reads. The SSDs today have managed to make the disk subsystems relatively fast, okay? But the CPUs are still even faster. Right now, if you do benchmarking for performance, a lot of times you'll realize that the CPUs are sitting idle while they're doing reads and writes from memory. So all of the old things that you think about, about like what is fast and what is slow, by all means, benchmark them and verify them before you start making assumptions and coding your program one way or another. Um, that's kind of an advanced topic. We're talking about reading things out of CSV files, but the point is, is that don't believe the assumptions, prove them to yourself when it comes to performance, because I've seen people write really crazy code in order to make things perform really fast, only to benchmark them, and the simpler solution actually was faster. So here we go, we're reading it, every row we print it out. So far we're getting almost the same thing. The only difference is that we are actually using the C, uh, CSV reader object as providing the rows. Okay, and that's about all that they really cover in the CSV um, reader which is kind of unusual considering that almost all of the interesting things that you'll do with the data occurs after reading. You're going to act on this data. So generally speaking, uh, I would have expected a little bit more in the sense of maybe some sort of tying back into the regex class that we just had in order to see whether or not a value looks like a number or tying back into the other text parsing classes that we had where you just parse the number out and then if it doesn't work, you capture the exception and, and recover somehow. But the point is, is that you'll read this text in, whatever the problem is you're trying to solve, that's when the next thing happens. And so uh, this is nice to just sort of extend your knowledge, but it doesn't actually show you a practical use. Yes? This last line, the reader object can be looped over only once. Ah. What? So, in some programming languages and in modern libraries that are available to Python, if you have the reader object, the reader object maintains its position on where it's reading inside the file. And so, like, you might be able to say, reset that and read it again. In other words, if I wanted to process all of these values twice, Let's say I wanted to first find out what the maximum value was, and then I wanted to calculate the difference, the distance from that maximum value of the other values. Then a very simple way of processing this would be to read the entire file, capturing, just looking for the maximum. If this value is bigger, then swap it out, and the one that I'm maintaining is the maximum. And then you could say, put another for loop saying for row in example reader and perform your computations. And because you're reading from that reader twice, many people would expect it to start at the beginning of the file again and read all the way down again, okay? This is supported in a lot of languages. It just so happens that the age and the way that the CSV reader is structured once you read a line, there is no such thing as backing up. And so like if you read to the bottom of the reader, there is no such thing as like resetting it to go back to the first line. And that's what it means by the reader can only be used once. It doesn't mean that you can only use it one time as a variable. It just means you, there is no mechanism by which you can read the same row out of it twice. It is. It is. I mean, there are some libraries that, um, due to their feature set, you can actually, like, back up a row. You can peek ahead. You know, you can reset to the first line. Just not this one. If you skipped forward, it would not be a problem. You would just read the row and then not do something with it. Okay? 
And so that means that um, basically if you wanted to say loop through the entries in example reader twice, you'd have to close and reopen the file and rebuild a new CVS reader for it. Not elegant, but Right, because the file pointer will be in the wrong spot. <laughs> yes, you felt that cringy thing that I was attempting to uh, not display while I'm presenting. Okay, but this is what, hey, look, this is a really old file format, okay? Reading it forward was great back then. People have set the bar higher now. Okay, I see some, some grins out there. All right, so writer objects. Well, writer objects, if you thought that there were some things about the reader object not being able to reset, then you'll see another common programming pattern in the writer object that should have gone away a long time ago. But due to compatibility and the age of the module, you will see that there's a magic value in this writer. New line is nothing. Now this does not actually mean that it looks for nothing as the new line. What this actually does is this actually manages to override the carriage return with nothing. So you'll get only one appropriate new line at the end of the CSV file. It only needs to be set on some operating systems. If you don't set it, you get an output with two new lines. So yes, it's an old module. It comes with all the quirks of an old module. And this is just something that you will have to remember to do. All right. But the other points in here, such as the open, is the same. The writing is the same. We just don't want the Python file to be adding new lines. What happens is, is when you write a line to a Python file, it adds the new line for you. When you write a line using the CVS writer, the CVS writer adds a new line for you. When you combine both of these together, you get two new lines. So you need to open the Python file suppressing the new line output, because that is configurable whereas the, um, the Python writer is not, okay? So here we've got our CVS writer, which is hooked up to the output file, okay? And we're going to write a row. So output writer, write row, spam eggs, bacon, and ham, okay? It will use the appropriate rules for CVS in order to build up the line of text that goes into this file. And like many writers, it will return back the number of characters that are to be written. All right. So likewise, when we do hello world, eggs, bacon, and ham, it will return back the number of characters to be written. Now this is where using a CVS library really starts to make sense hello comma world, that contains a what in it? And if you say salutation, I know I've got a tough crowd. <laughs> it contains a comma in it. If you thought that processing CVS was so simple that you just simply split on commas, and if you didn't have all your input validated to make sure that it didn't have commas in it, Sooner or later, you'd get an error, and this would be the introduction of one of those errors. So the point is, is that the reason that you really do want to use CVS, the CVS module is to basically avoid these kinds of errors. Because I promise you, for everybody who uses your application, there's one guy out there that when, he sa when they say, enter your age, he types 32 in text with a hyphen. You know, so the point is, is that Using these libraries, make sure that those values, even if they're nonsensical, 
get encoded correctly and it doesn't break your processing. Likewise, it has no problem understanding uh, doubles or floats or whatever. And so here we've got an output writer, write row. And then in order to finish the file off, we close it. Now closing it's going to do a couple of things. One, just because you say write row doesn't mean that the stuff has actually hit the disk. Okay, it may still be in RAM. The operating system may be holding it until basically there's a little bit of extra time to write it to disk. You could be swapped on and off the CPU. A lot of things can happen. Close will force a flush of the file. So you always need to assume that your file is not correctly written until you call close on it. It might be correctly written, but it also might not be. So when you program using file abstractions, by all means, make sure that you have your clothes easily accessible and in a place where you can logically reason that if the file was open, the file was most certainly closed. OK. Uh, the old time problems of the operating system running out of space for keeping open file handles have been mostly solved by basically having computers that are modern enough that they've reset the defaults to very high values. But it is also possible that if you open a very large number of files without closing them in a system that has not been configured for new limits, you can actually get an error that you can't open another file because you've ran out of operating system file handles. Um, generally speaking, this means that if you're processing files in a loop, Try to limit the number of files that you're processing in them. If you're doing them in parallel, put limits on how many of them you'll open simultaneously. Okay? So, call open, pass it a W. What does W do? This is still just Python files. We call write. Very good. It creates it if it's not there. All right, you can use flags to basically force it to create or force it to die if it's already there. But the point is, is you write it, gives you a writer object. Here's a little commentary about the double new line. If you allow Python's file handle to add new lines at the same time you're allowing CVS's writer to add new lines. Here's a little thing that says, hey, by the way, you need to make new line nothing inside the Python file uh, object. We use the write row off of the CVS writer, and the code's going to produce output that looks like this. Notice the double quotes that is the flag for CVS file format that the comma is not actually a separator. OK. So delimiter in line. Uh, ugh. Delimiter and line terminator keyword arguments. CVS files, we'd mentioned that there's a lot of times where you get these records that are separated by some sort of a delimiter. Unfortunately, CVS was not the only format in town that used this processing. You also have tab separated values. You have colon separated values. For those of you who have worked on systems that you probably don't want to think about, you have pipe separated values. Oh, I made someone cringe over there. And uh, the point is, is there's been a lot of arguments as to like, what is the best separator? And the answer is, it doesn't matter anymore because people have already used more than one. And so if you want to say, build your writer, to basically have a special delimiter, a special field separator, you can use the named parameter delimiter. You set that to something, and it'll put that in between every one of the values. Likewise, if you're on a platform, and let's say you're writing files that are destined to go to a Windows system, even though you're on a Linux system, you can use the line terminator named parameter in order to specify how you want to terminate your lines. OK? Again, you write the row. Again, it's going to return back. This is a REPL, so it's just returning back the number of characters. If you were doing this in sort of a safe way, 
you would actually capture the number of characters back and ensure that you actually wrote them by having, say, an if statement around it to see that it was more than zero. Okay, you close it off, and lo and behold, because this is HTML formatting, and so it's going to swallow a lot of the white space, I will attempt to show you what really is happening here. Apples, tab, oranges, tab, grapes. The spacing in between these is a little bit off, you might notice, because it looks like there's two spaces between apples and oranges. No, this is just how tabs are rendered out. It will go to the next tab stop. Two new lines under it, which gives it the impression of a blank line. All right. Eggs, tab, you'll notice that bacon is lined up with oranges. Ham is also tabbed over to the tab space, which is grapes. Now, if your tab space is set to where that alignment doesn't work very well because you overflowed, you'll go to the next tab stop, wherever that is. Who, re who took typing class and knows what a tab stop really is? Okay, you probably completely understand what I'm talking about, but on the old typewriters, there used to be little sliders, okay? And you would slide them over, and every time you press the tab key, really what happened was your typewriter carriage would just start sliding along until it hit the tab stop. And then that's where your next letter would be typed. So that means that if you typed a really long word, you would type past that tab stop, and when you press tab, it would slide along until it hit the next tab stop. This formatting, for one reason or another, due to the history of how teletypes were integrated into computers, and due to the history of how much secretarial work got translated directly into typing, and the typing got translated directly into presenting stuff on the screen, was preserved. And it is confusing as all get up when you actually have a long value that wraps. This is the reason why I don't like presenting tab delimited information. All right, but the point is, is that if, say, bacon was asparagus with a fried egg and, uh, you know, cheese on top, then that means that the ham would not line up with grapes. It would line up with something like the fourth spam down there. So the point is, is that This is separated by tabs, which means that it's got a variable number of spaces that will be displayed when you're looking at it on screen. It's got two new lines, and then due to the magic of HTML swallowing white space, this eggs, bacon, and ham should also have another new line underneath it. And this bottom row basically is presented more or less as it should be, except that that's not multiple spaces, that's one tab character. The, um, one thing that you may not have thought about is because of the format in which CSV files are rendered, it's a lot, it's easy to think of them as two-dimensional arrays, but a two-dimensional array always has a value for every index it's defined to have a value for. So if you've got a three by five array, you have basically 15 cells in it. Because this is a line and value type sort of system, these are like ragged cells. The third line has six entries in it, but the second line doesn't. The second line only has three. This is the reason why sometimes it's more appropriate to process your stuff line by line because you can then put in a check to see, do I have a fifth element? And then avoid perhaps dying when you get to that one row that for one reason or another doesn't. And likewise, we could change out that tab character with a colon character and do all sorts of things. And if you use this module to write ETC password entries, oh, I hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so, um, so they have a project, and the project is relatively simple, and because it's so relatively simple, it's relatively low value. And what they're going to say is, pretend you have a bunch of CSV files and you need to remove the headers off of them. 
Well, you know, there's a lot of ways of doing it. And if you truly do have a bunch of CSV files and want to remove the headers off of it, then the most logical way would be to open up every CSV file, read in the results, skip over the first line, and write them back out. I mean, it's a pretty easy idea. So lo and behold, he's going to come to the same conclusion, read the contents of the file, write them back out, skipping the first line. Now, when you do this kind of reading from a file and writing to a file, there is basically one rule that will save you. Never write to the same file. And the reason why is because when you're reading a file and writing to a file, now we're trimming from this file, okay? So you might think it's safe because you're writing to the line that's not the line you're reading from. But files are not laid out in some sort of a line thing. They're laid out with every character after every other character. And the new line is just a character that lets a person or a library interpret that you're on the next line. So if you say, read a very short line of headers, maybe that are labeled A, B, C, and D, and then read the next line, which has nice long values, your next line will actually overwrite the end of that new line and start writing into your next set of values, which, assuming you read it before you started writing it, is probably not going to break your program. That said, if your program gets interrupted anywhere through the writing of that file, you will no longer have a file that follows the format you thought it did. Okay? And if you do this in the opposite direction, or do this in any other way that might theoretically have a line written that's longer than the line it's overwriting, you will definitely have data loss. So he's going to solve it by just simply saying, write it out to another one. So he's going to open up OS Lister, skip the non-CSV files, write them all out into another directory. So here we are. We import CSV and OS. He's using the comma-based import. Not my favorite, but it works. Uses OS make dirs to make a header removed directory. And if it exists, he's not going to fail. And then he basically says for every file name. Now, this is a misnomer. I don't like this naming convention. That should just be for every file name. Because we have not validated that these are CSV files at all. They could be any kind of file. So he says for every file name in OS Lister, if that file name does not end in CSV. So he's using the not operation. Remember, this is going to return back a Boolean value, and then the not operation will flip it. Then skip it. Of course, this is not the real way that you check to see if CSV file is a CSV file. This is just the way that you check to see if the name says .csv. There are better ways of doing it. Then he says, print removing the header from this file name, and he leaves a couple of to-dos. Read the file in and write the file out. So skipping down to read the file in. He's decided that he's got his rows array. He opens it up. He creates the reader. All right. Then he says, for the row and reader object, if the line number is 1, skip it. Otherwise, add it to the CVS rows, okay, which the reader is uh, uh, basically going to, um, to write, and then close it out. Now, who can tell me the problems with this code right now? Or I should say, close the, uh, close the input file. Who can tell me the problems with this right now? We just went through a whole thing talking about trying to not maintain the entire contents of the file in RAM. And so, as a follow-up, he reads each row in one at a time and then adds all of those to an array. 
there is a better way of doing it. You can open your reader and writer at the same time, read one row, capture it to nothing, and then read the rest and write them to the writer. So here he is, and now it's time for him to actually take this giant array that he's cached in RAM and write it out. So he opens the file for writing it out. Okay, He's going to add in the directory name and add in the CVS file name to the path that uh, you know, is the current working directory, and he writes it out. And so for every row in CVS rows, then he does the CVS writer write row. So if we wanted to do something that was a little bit better than his example, which I don't normally um, you know, like to buck an author right in the middle of uh, his class, but in, you know, his book, but let's just do this. We could easily do something very similar to this. Okay, instead of using that incredibly simple uh, processing loop that he had described before, we're going to do this. We will simply open the uh, reader, and we will likewise open the writer. Then, for every row in the reader object, if the line is 1, we will skip it, same way he did. Otherwise, we will write the row directly. Ah, apparently I pressed F1. Yes, my VI does have help. There. Now we don't cache all of the rows into some sort of an array. You see how that works? at the cost of opening up two files at once. OK. So that pretty much covers the CSV section. And he has ideas of similar programs. And his ideas of similar programs look very much like a cut and paste of his ideas of similar programs when we did Excel processing. But I can definitely tell you that there's some more interesting things to do than these. For example, it might be very nice to say, have a max and min value finder. You know, because sometimes that's actually going to be reused. And so you might want to consider, if these look very simple to you, creating a CSV max and min finder, where you would say min find. CSV file, the column that you want to find that minimum on. OK? And if you get really sophisticated, then you can do a mean mode median or uh, you know, a little box plot. So JSON, time for JSON. This is a JSON object. OK, this is a dictionary. It has a name, Sophie. Is cat, which is true. Mice caught, which is zero. Naps taken, three, 37 and a half. I don't know how you do a half nap. And a feline IQ that is undefined. 
So JSON is useful because basically it is uh, used a lot in data transfer. Occasionally it's used in other places like configuration, which hopefully you don't have to deal with too much of that, but sometimes it is. Um, it's also heavily used in um, uh, web APIs. And if you're using something that's using JSON, then you pretty much need to have a way of processing JSON. How are we on food? Here. Oh, someone should have told me. Let's stop before we get into JSON. It's time to talk about JSON. OK, the JSON module. JSON is, again, a big string until it gets processed. And then it turns into a structured data structure that uh, follows the rules of JavaScript's data structures. But that said, it's sometimes used in order to communicate back and forth between web services and some various other things. And so here we have a string of JSON data. And this JSON data happens to encode a dictionary. We've got a key and a value, key and a value, key and a value, key and a value. Now, the way that you use the Python JSON module is very similar to the way that you use all the other modules, except that it's going to be operating on the string level because a lot of times you're not pulling in this information from a file handle. You'll be pulling it across a network socket or something like that. And so here you can see that we import JSON, and then we use this JSON loads. Now, for all of you who kind of felt like, oh, really, with the stuff that we talked about with the CSV module, you'll really enjoy that loads does not actually mean loads. Um, it is sort of a Hungarian-ish notation for load string. And that means that you're now loading this module, uh, loading this object from a string. And lo and behold, whereas this string before had these little quotes around the outside, after you load this value from the string, it is an actual JSON dictionary, or a map as I like to call them. And you can see that it took the, the null value and turned it into the appropriate uh, Python none value, and likewise, it took the numeric zero and turned it into uh, an integer zero, and the true value and turned it into the appropriate Python true value. So there's a little bit of data translation going on in order to make sure that the values are wrapped in the most appropriate values that are represented inside of Python. Now, with loads, great, or load string, I should say, you can definitely take any Python, uh, any JSON string that maybe you captured on a network socket or somewhere else, and turn it into um, arrays, dictionaries containing arrays, containing dictionaries, containing dictionaries, containing arrays. It'll do all of the unnesting appropriately. Likewise, you have the dump string value which will take any Python value and come up with the most appropriate JSON representation of it. And so here we have this Python value, which is this dictionary that we had before. We're going to import JSON, and we're going to use the dump string in order to pull out the string of JSON data from this Python dictionary. And so now here, if you careful observation, you'll notice the quotes around it and that the other quotes are nested inside. So this means that this is actually one big string and not a dictionary. So he has a project that he likes to, he wants to cover about fetching the current weather data. Considering the age of this book, let's see. The source that he is fetching it from is 
I think, gone. I did do a typo in that, so I'm not sure. I'm going to make sure that. Nope. It's still there. OK, so there is a chance that its API is still present and still functioning correctly. And so here is its API information. You can basically use this URL. And you'll notice that you're providing your latitude and longitude. And then it will pull out a JSON uh, response, which of course will come to you as a string. And you'll be able to parse that. So first, he's like, OK, well, what we need to do is we need to build a program. It'll ask the location that you want the weather for. And then he's going to do something that uh, I don't really think is a very good technique. Um, and I understand why he's doing it. Uh, if you, say, run a command like command New York, because of the way that the command line parameters are handled, new is one parameter to command, and York is a second parameter. And because, for one reason or another, he doesn't ask people to do that, to where it passes one parameter, which is the city name, the first step that he's going to do in his program is take all of the parameterized words and create one string out of them with spaces in between the parameters. Please do not read this example as it's written and do this. Instead, have people escape up multi-word city names because this will make your program more reusable in scripts in the future. So here, he basically says that he's going to use the space and use that as a joiner against all of the arguments that are passed in except for the first one. He's skipping over the arg0. And the reason he's skipping over arg0 is because arg0 would actually return back the text that the command was called with. So that it would return back the string command in this case. Once he has that location, he's going to use that as a parameter. And he's going to use this open API, uh, this API open weather map in order to fetch the daily forecast for that location. It's just string concatenation. It's not particularly uh, fascinating. Here he decides to use the percent %s formatter and to pass the location in as the string to be formatted there. Once he does that, he gets the response from that URL and basically waits for it to be the, the round trip processing to occur. Once he has that, he will use the responses text because responses come with both headers, status codes, and text. And so he'll use the responses text, which will be the string. And this is an example of the expected output of that response. And of course, if you use the JSON uh, uh, load string or loads, <coughs> Uh, method, you can turn that into a data structure. When you have a data structure, you can then start referring to, and of course he's uh, pulled that information into a data structure called weather data, and then he basically asks for the list element underneath there, and then the first entry on the list element, the entry for the weather dictionary, the zeroth entry for that weather dictionary, and then the description for that in its nested map. So if we follow that through, that would mean list, first entry in this array, 
array, the weather data, which is an array, the first entry in this weather data, and then the description, which is going to have the value sky is clear. So this entire reference right here will say sky is clear when it's fully resolved. And we can likewise follow through the data structure to find this item. This is why it's important to use a well-documented, easy, reasonable API endpoint. Because you're not going to know which values these are. And if it's very irregular in its responses back, it's going to mean that you're going to have to write a lot of conditional code in order to pull back the right value under the right conditions. Um, but that said, it's still far easier than scraping like we did with soup. Who did the soup scraping exercises? Where you, you use the tags? Awesome. I see a few very timid sort of waving your hands. Nobody likes to say that they parsed HTML. It's a really nasty thing. Um, but the point is, is that referencing things like this is far easier than referencing them out of an actual web page. And uh, so the point is that uh, these API endpoints that respond back with JSON or XML become more stable if you want to write programs that operate more correctly for a longer period of time. And so here's his output. The current weather in the city that he provided, clear is the value that's tied underneath main. It's the main description of the weather. And then it says sky is clear. Tomorrow, clouds, few clouds. Day after tomorrow, clear, sky is clear. OK. So that gives you a walkthrough of how you might use JSON if you wanted to write something that would call a JSON endpoint, a JSON you know, web service. And he comes up with a couple of similar programs that he says you might want to do, like maybe extend this in order to see which campsites have the best weather. Well, it's a stretch, but I could see how that could be useful. Um, schedule a program to regularly check the weather. Notice that the text that's returned back is so much smaller than a full web page. I mean, it's a lot of information, but it's a lot less than a full web page. API endpoints like this are designed specifically to be processed by other systems. This means that if you have the option between scraping a web page and using an API endpoint, please be kind to the people who are providing the data and use the API endpoint. Okay. That web page, they have to pay for the bandwidth in the uh, computer systems to pump back a lot of unnecessary HTML tags, ads, images, other things like that. These API endpoints will just basically contain just the data of course, sometimes there's no data available. Then you might have to scrape the web page. So if you want to regularly check the weather and send you a frost alert if you need to move your plants indoors. OK, it's kind of interesting. I'm not sure if there's a business case for it, but there might be for the right business. And then pull the weather dates from multiple sites to show them all at once and perhaps you know, see whether they're all in agreement. Who knows? So the point is, is that CSV and JSON are two formats that hold information, but they're both text formats. They have different rules in their structuring, how they're nested, and how you can uh, basically represent information within them. And now you've got exposure to both the CSV and the JSON libraries inside the uh, Python environment, and can use those libraries to move information out of CSV files into a Python environment, from a Python environment into CSV files, likewise from JSON strings into a Python environment, and from a Python environment back into JSON strings. And uh, that means that you've got a few more tools in your uh, Python toolkit, and you can definitely uh, use them where appropriate. So do we have any questions?
Fantastic. Well, in that case, that's about all I've got to say about CSV and Python and uh, JSON. And uh, if you decide that you have a question that you didn't think of right now, you're more than welcome to come up and ask me later. Thank you. <laughs>